Gloria Patria, Filio, Spiritui Sancto. Sigma Terra, Principia, et Nunca Semper, et Sessatas, Seculorum. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. I had no idea there would be this many people here tonight. I would have worn my good cassock. And what else? Uh, in addition, yes, to um, uh, assisting here at St. Anne's and um, be one of the chaplains at our high school, I also assist a great deal um, with vocations in the diocese, but at our seminary as well, which is about 75 yards that way. Um, when the guys don't have one of the world's best Latin teachers here, Dr. Nancy Llewellyn, giving uh, intensive courses to the guys who are stuck with me on a weekly basis. Uh, so I, I get to teach our guys uh, Latin, and uh, it's, it's a great pleasure. Um, so the topic tonight is why do we have Latin in the liturgy? My answer is because it's awesome, and that's it. Do you have any questions? <laughs> now there's a little bit more to it. Um, we're not going to go too much into the historical part of it. We're just going to go, we're going to hit sort of major ideas. You're just going to have like pellets of truth, shotgun blasted, and whatever topic enters my mind at the, at the moment. Um, and so, first of all, um, there actually is something that the Vatican put out which addresses this directly, which I didn't know about. You know, this is my third talk about Latin at St. Anne's, but I talk about Latin in different capacities. I've given a talk about the usefulness, the uh, educational value of Latin, which is absolutely tremendous, so make sure your children get as much Latin as they possibly can. It can sharpen their minds in a way unlike any other language, uh, and to really help to perfect their minds so that they become critical thinkers and you know, not fall prey to the errors of the world. You know, I graduated from UNC, and you know, I didn't, I didn't know how to think. And oh, you can see State people are not here yet to get to the But it really wasn't until I started studying Latin and um, philosophy. And then it feels like a light bulb turns on. Um, and you can just think a lot more critically. And Latin plays a huge part in that. Also, I've spoken about the role of Latin in seminary uh, formation. And you know, I have to say, the Latin formation you guys are receiving here is unlike anything that I know of literally in the world. And to have that living Latin experience and to experience it as a language, a living language that you engage uh, with uh, intimately, liturgically, and, and, and other prayers and whatever, um, is very important. And actually, it's still the mind of the church that our seminarians and our priests be perfectly fluent in Latin. And they're not. And everybody's ignored the, the very, very weighty documents, especially coming from Pope St. John the 23rd, uh, that all these guys need to be fluent in Latin. Uh, so here in Charlotte, North Carolina, we're you know, really trying to respond to that to the letter. Uh, so please pray for the continued efforts in regards to that. So tonight, it's really is why we have Latin in the liturgy. Just a few historical notes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just to let you know where, whence it came. Um, you know, originally, the Western Church uh, in Rome, mostly, the liturgy was in Greek. Um, and that was a used language. When, you know, Paul was imprisoned in Rome, he's using Greek. Although both Peter and Paul would have been exposed uh, to Latin. And so you have the princes of the church, uh, from day one, being exposed to the church's own language. Um, but it's not until the 300s that it really gets adopted into uh, the liturgy and in particular by Pope Damasus, who dies in 384. And really, it's, it's in his time that a transition begins. Now, the church in the West is already uh, heading towards Latin even earlier because in North Africa, which was a bustling area of the world for Christianity before uh, the Muslims uh, just violently took over, um, that's where Latin was first really being used. And so you have uh, Tertullian and others employing Latin in the engaged in theology. Uh, for instance, the word Trinity, Trinitas, is coming from some of your North Africa, in particular Tertullian, um, using the Latin language to describe these things which are most dear to us, namely God. What is God? He's a Trinitas, he's the Trinity. 
Um, this first part of uh, my talk, I'm actually pulling right off of the Vatican website. So I didn't know in 2009, Pope Benedict's, uh, onto his uh, liturgical office, put out a letter talking about the use of Latin in the liturgy, and I just discovered this recently. Wow, that pretty much, yeah, that covers it. Uh, and so, in this letter, he, it mentions how, yes, Greek was the first sort of language in the West, but it quickly trans transitions into Latin by the time of Damasus. Uh, but it also reminds us that every official liturgical book of the Roman Rite is published in Latin even today. And it reminds us that in the Code of Canon Law, Canon 928, uh, the, you quote, the Eucharistic celebration is to be carried out in the Latin language or in another language provided that the liturgical texts have been legitimately approved, uh, end quote. Uh, taking into consideration the present situation, this canon translates in a concise manner the teaching of the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy of the Second Vatican Council. And then uh, we're reminded that Vatican II, this is the Vatican II that supposedly threw out Latin entirely, you know, on the document on the liturgy, Sacra Sanctum Concilium, paragraph 36, it says, quote, particular law remaining in force, the use of the Latin language is to be preserved in the Latin rites. Let me say that again. This is Vatican II, authoritatively talking to us about Latin in the liturgy. Particular law remaining in force, the use of the Latin language is to be preserved in the Latin rites. I should add that not even the Council of Trent would have made that type of comment. But of course, uh, it does go on, um, uh, the, the, that document of Vatican II, in which it begins making provisions uh, for possibilities of the vernacular singling out, for instance, readings and the prayers of the faithful and such. Um, I mean, this document, in a lot of ways, you can feel it's a compromised document. You can see the strains of different groups getting uh, printed in different paragraphs. Uh, so, you know, they'll say, yes, Latin is to be preserved. In other places, they'll say, but uh, we can begin using vernacular in these uh, few areas. But this letter from Pope Benedict in 2009, uh, it just goes on to say, in a sense, the code, the code of canon law, the church's law, affirms, first of all, quote, the Eucharistic celebration is to be carried out in the Latin language. So the way that Pope Benedict's liturgy office at the time was interpreting this is that Latin does take pride of place, even if uh, vernacular can be used. Um, and then it goes into uh, this particular section, what could be used. Um, on the basis of those subsequent sections, the code adds, quote, or the other language, the other language provided in the liturgical text has been legitimately approved so that these things can be used. But it goes on. It, just saying that the other, other languages could be used um, just based on what uh, the Second Vatican Council had said. Uh, but here's an important part. As can be seen, likewise, according to the present norms, the Latin language still holds primacy of place as that language which, based on principle, the Church prefers, even though she recognizes that the vernacular can be useful for the faithful. In the present concrete situation, liturgical celebrations in Latin have become rather rare. No duh. <laughs> Hence, uh, motivation for using Latin is because in the papal liturgy, but not only in the papal liturgy, Latin should be safeguarded as a precious inheritance of the Western liturgical tradition. And then this letter uh, quotes Pope St. John Paul II in a letter that he wrote in 1980, uh, in which he talks about Latin, quote, the Roman Church has special obligations towards Latin, the splendid language of ancient Rome and she must manifest them wherever the occasion presents itself. And then lastly, of course, Pope Benedict's own uh, apostolic exhortation, uh, Sacramentum Caritatis, quote, Speaking more generally, I ask that future priests from their time in the seminary receive the preparation needed to understand and to celebrate Mass in Latin, and also to use Latin texts and execute Gregorian chant. 
Nor should we forget that the faithful can be taught to recite more common prayers in Latin and also to sing parts of the liturgy to Gregorian chant. Okay? So these are just, you know, sort of the highlights of the church's most recent thoughts on Latin and the liturgy. Um, but if we just take a step back, let's just have a bird's eye view of the situation. So since the time of Pope Damasus of the 4th century, until the 1960s, this was a complete non-issue. I mean, there may have been some murmurings that the, the church quickly is, you know, sort of squashed here or there, but this was a non-issue in the life of the church. And there were some people sort of pushing for it right before uh, the Second Vatican Council to begin transitioning us to the vernacular. But let's be clear. I mean, eight months before Vatican II, in February of 1962, Pope John, Saint Pope Saint John XXIII, in his dynamite document, Veterum Sapientia, which primarily is about the formation of priests in regards to the Latin language, I mean, he makes it very clear that Latin is here to stay and that, if anything, it should be defended and bolstered and it should be strengthened. Um, and he says, and for anybody who's beginning to challenge this in the liturgy, this is from uh, John the 23rd, in the exercise of their paternal care, they, the bishops, shall be on their guard lest anyone under their jurisdiction eager for revolutionary changes, writes against the use of Latin in the teaching of the higher sacred studies in seminary, or in the liturgy, or through prejudice make light of the Holy See's will in regard, in this regard, or interprets it, interprets it falsely. So if you're even writing against the use of Latin in the liturgy, Pope St. John XXIII, the supposed liberator of the church, to throw away all the bad old Latin stuff, and the usher and all the vernacular stuff, he is telling bishops, if anybody in your jurisdiction writes against the use of Latin in the liturgy, you know, you can't have that. And so, he in a way was preparing Vatican II with this landmark document saying, we are going, I know you guys are starting to talk against Latin, but this is the mind of the Holy See in this regard. And he put his money where his mouth was. Two months after that document, in April 1962, the Ordinaciones uh, were published, which were basically how that document was to be implemented concretely in seminaries. And it was tough. I mean, they even envisioned sort of commission visiting seminaries to make sure that, yes, the seminaries were becoming completely fluent uh, in Latin. Okay, so again, that's beginning to veer off into Latin formation. I love that stuff. I'll, I will have some self-restraint here. I'll bring it back to the liturgy. But nonetheless, that is the mind of the church going into Vatican II, and that is the mind of John the Twenty-Third. And of course, Latin is to remain in the liturgy. Okay. What world happened? Uh, chaos, sin, um, strife, all sorts of things. Um, immediately after the, the publishing of this document, uh, Sacra Sancta Concilium, in I believe December 1963, uh, uh, Pope Paul VI uh, wrote a motu proprio, uh, not, uh, basically, creating this group, Concilium, to implement the document in the light of the church, which was a completely new idea. It usually went to the Congregation of Sacred Rights, Sacred Congregation of Rights. But nonetheless, he created this new group, um, and they were to be responsible. These guys hated Latin, uh, but nonetheless, they were given responsibility for the document. So we have a new hope, and perhaps he's more open to uh, different ideas, but certainly from uh, John the 23rd on this matter. And so, almost immediately, this group gets to work very quickly, and by 1964, um, what month was it? September 1964, uh, they published a document, Pope's Permission, Inter Ecumenici, uh, which was sort of the first real, uh, the document which would give us the first changes after, well, after the Council, the Council's still going on. 
in inter uh basically it gives permission not just to do a couple of things in the vernacular, which is what the document said, the readings of the prayers of the faithful, um, but rather virtually everything, minus the Eucharistic prayer and the preface that immediately uh, precedes it. And so, uh, <coughs> also in that uh, Lord Proprio, um, Paul VI had given permission for uh, conferences of bishops to be able to decide uh, how they wanted to implement any vernacular changes uh, in their conferences. And so, you know, we're conference by conference, really diocese by diocese, in a lot of ways, parish by parish, uh, a lot of cases, uh, how we are to feel these changes. So in uh, America, uh, these changes were first felt in the first Sunday of Advent, 1964. Um, and everybody has different stories about that experience, most of which seem to be horror stories, a statue being thrown out of windows and whatever else. And you go from Latin or growing chant one Sunday to, I don't know, um, the Beatles or whatever the next. Um, and it was a really drastic change. The changes uh, came to Italy, I believe it was in March of 1965, um, where they were implemented for the first time. And then a couple of years later, uh, in 1967, another document of no trace of being anonymous, uh, sort of, it gave some more liturgical changes, like the manifold could be optional, um, but also the remaining part of the Mass that had been Latin, namely the Eucharistic prayer, that could now be in the vernacular. And virtually everywhere in the world, it seemed uh, we went from total Latin to total vernacular. Um, against the will of Vatican II itself. You know, these were changes that came after uh, Vatican II. So that's sort of the historical aspect of what happened with Latin. But I suppose almost um, more important is the why. Why do we have Latin in the liturgy? Uh, just one more note on the historical aspect, which sort of segues into the why. Um, the church, it wasn't like the church sat around and had a committee, you know, a bunch of Italian smoking, drinking coffee, saying, this is what we're going to do for the next 17 centuries. I mean, this is just the way things developed. It's a natural, organic development of how the church um, celebrated or, or worshipped her Lord throughout the centuries. So uh, Greek transitioned over into Latin in the fourth century, and it just stayed there, it, everywhere in the Western Church, and that was simply it. Uh, and a big point to remember is that the Church never had the idea of, hey, why don't we just start changing stuff? Why don't we just start doing what we want now? Uh, and applying that, of course, to the liturgy. She never thought that way. Um, and this is a comment on liturgy in general. Um, you know, since the opening days of salvation history, remember that God had his idea how he wanted to be worshipped. And we were not the creators of that, going to Cain and Abel. You know, Abel uh, offered the first thing, the first things of his flock, and Cain of fruit, uh, his, his whatever grain, whatever he was growing. And it says in Genesis 4 that God had regard for Abel's sacrifice, but not for Cain's. I don't know why. Maybe God's done like a cute little sheep or something. I don't know. But the point is, he had his idea of how he wanted to be worshipped. Uh, and it was objective. It's something that uh, Cain and Abel needed to conform to. And uh, you, you fast forward, you get into um, uh, the time of Moses. Moses goes up the mountain and receives the plan from God how he, how he God, wants to be worshipped. He's not at the top of the mountain looking down there like, all right, these Jews are going to like this, this, and this, so why don't we, you know, put this together for worship. No, he received the blueprints of everything from God. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant, the, how it's to be transported, how it's to be worshipped, the type of sacrifices. So he receives from God, okay? And as soon as you start acting up, like Aaron's sons, uh, those knuckleheads, uh, Ahab and... Um, Whatever. They started offering strange fires before the Roman Catholic. I was never a Protestant, like, so I don't know the names. <laughs> but they offered a strange fire before the Lord, an unauthorized fire. Uh, and they were a little thorough. And 
men that fire went out and consumed them. And they gave glory by dying to the Lord. And I always warn my thoroughfares, you mess up one little thing, and you're going to get consumed by that thoroughfare. You look at me the wrong way, it's going to, no, I'd be arrested. Um, so, and it just continued. That was, we received how God wants to be worshipped, we are faithful to it, we hand it on to the next generation. And that happens throughout the entire Old Testament. Our Lord says, do this in remembrance of me, not just do what you want, right? Do this. And Paul says, one time Paul talks about the liturgy, he says, as I have received from the Lord, so I hand on to you that the night before the Lord was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and goes into uh, narrative. But as I receive from the Lord, so I hand on uh, to you. And that's how we did it for countless centuries, and that's how we ought to do it today. Um, and that's a very, very important lesson, I think, in regards to Latin, because it touches on the liturgy in general. You know, Latin requires a lot from us. It requires us to humble ourselves and to submit to it. The extraordinary form does it the exact same way. I remember uh, a professor friend of mine who loves Latin Mass now, he said, he was so funny, he was studying in Washington and he was leaving the Cathedral of St. Matthew there and a, a black homeless man walked up to him um, and he just walked right up to him and said, you have got to go to the old Latin Mass at Old St. Mary's. <laughs> Then some other homeless man was stealing his bike, so he got preoccupied and they take care of the bike situation. But that's how my friend was invited to the Latin Mass. Um, and so he went, and he said the first time he hated it. Why? Because for the first time, I felt like I had to bow down to it. And I had to humble myself. I think a big aspect of that, of course, is the Latin language. We humble ourselves to it, and it becomes much more difficult for us to sort of make our own and do what we want um, when it's not a uh, lingua materna, a, a language that we grow up uh, speaking. So that's the first, I think, very, very important point. It's a mentality that I think is a very dangerous one that we must all avoid, that of consumerism brought into the house of God. I want it just like Burger King my way. Um, and a lot of times when it comes to the liturgical wars, and of course Latin being a huge issue, you simply can't reason with certain people. They want what they want. Just like you go to a restaurant and you want the steak the way that you want it. Period. And they have to conform to that. Um, that is, you know, you just look at humanity in general, salvation history in general, man's relationship with God in general, and that whole idea of God and great worship is supposed to happen and needs to conform to me, to my likings, I think that's a very fundamental error. <coughs> Alright, so let's hit a couple of um, uh, other issues, just sort of, again, shotgun blast um, as to why I think Latin, not just I, but why Latin is important. Uh, first of all, it, it is a non-vernacular language. Um, and it connotes mystery. Um, and it's a form of veiling. You know, we, we veil our most sacred things, um, the tabernacle, the chalice, the blessed sacrament. Um, women are veiled because life begins in them, and we consider that very, very sacred. Um, and veiling is a form of revealing, revealing how important something is. That it's not vulgar, it's not just whatever, here, let's do that. But no, this is actually special and sacred. And so, of course, uh, the language between the bride and the bridegroom in that relationship is going to be a very, very special thing and ought to be uh, protected. And, um, and especially that air of mystery, that we don't have this whole God thing completely understood. Um, and that by acknowledging the mystery, we acknowledge that we must always go deeper uh, into that relationship. Uh, as soon as we think we know it all, we will be content right there. 
that mystery which is true, because we don't know God perfectly in this life. It, it motivates us to enter more deeply into the mysteries. What else? The liturgy is also, also has a special relationship with theology. In other words, it is the expression of our faith. The liturgy is our faith lived out, for it is the mysteries of Christ uh, represented in a very real way. And so the relationship between what we believe and how we worship God is an incredibly important relationship. And when John the Twenty Third uh, singled out Latin, it, the qualities of Latin, namely that it's universal, it's non-vernacular, and it's immutable or unchanging, these are the import, most important qualities of Latin. Uh, that reflects our theology as well. Our theology, what we believe, is universal, and this is a scandal that you know faithful countries like Poland and, and Africa. Uh, the continent of Africa, it seems, are faithful to the church's teaching on marriage, but meanwhile, Germany can believe something else um, in half of the U.S. Uh, bishops. Um, but we have one faith, and that one universal language reflects that one faith. Our faith is also unchanging. Jesus Christ doesn't change, and our faith is about Him. And so our faith will never change. It can never change. And this is what we're seeing right now in the very heart of the church. Men trying to change the faith. And that's an abomination. But what's so glorious about Latin is that it doesn't change either. Yes, it's a dead language, and I'm glad it's dead. Well, it's not dead. It's alive in many other ways. But that thing doesn't change. And it becomes a perfect conduit for communicating our faith throughout the ages and throughout all the many different countries. And so it protects, Latin protects our theology, uh, precisely because it doesn't change. And so that is expressed uh, very uniquely, um, very appropriately in the liturgy. You know, the liturgical texts used to be, you know, you just didn't touch them, okay? They were that sacred and important. Now it seems like, you know, every other day we can create a new liturgy with new text or whatever now. Um, but this is a far cry from the time of St. Thomas of Aquinas. You know, when St. Thomas, for instance, is writing about God as a trinity, you know, he will quote uh, scripture, he'll, he will quote the church fathers, he will also quote the liturgy. You know, the very same practice of the holy trinity that you all, if you attended the um, Latin Mass here last Sunday, those, that, those very words were quoted by St. Thomas as an argument for whatever he was arguing in regards to God being a trinity. And that the liturgical text, as enshrined in Latin, helped the church by means of St. Thomas Aquinas for us to understand our loving God more completely. All because of Latin. Uh, when something is sacred, it is reserved for holy things. That's what we mean. Okay, so a consecrated chalice is made sacred. And so it seems like a cup in a lot of ways, but it is pulled away from the world of cups and it's reserved to the worship of God. And that is what makes it sacred. When a priest uh, or a nun uh, or a religious brother or sister, when they take solemn vows, they are consecrated, they are made sacred, they are pulled away from the world. Uh, and the same with uh, a priest. And so, um, you know, to, um, to get in a fight with the priest, I know it's tempting. I mean, it's bad, it's a GS, lack of charity from your neighbor, but you're also hitting something sacred, so you don't want to be doing that. Okay? <laughs> but it's a, you know, a sin against, uh, what would it be, the first commandment, but against sacred would it be the first commandment, but against sacred things. I'm, I'm just a sacred, I'm just an object. I'm a sacred tool. Um, but we're reserved. And so uh, things that are reserved for the use of God are sacred. Um, they should be sacred. And so how beautiful and appropriate it is for man to reserve a special language, to have a special relationship with God. Um, it's sacred. And 
it's uh, worthy of God. It's worthy of our time to, to learn it. I know it can be difficult. Um, virtually, of course, in every other century, it seemed, uh, people just inherited, grew up with Latin, Latin mass, etc. It's more difficult sort of reviving it. But I suppose the missionaries had the difficulty of bringing Latin into indigenous communities in South America or Japan or wherever. Um, but how appropriate it is. You know, I remember Cardinal Renze commenting once that um, the idea of a sacred language uh, of course, isn't limited to Christianity. Um, Jesus, our blessed Lord, used a sacred language. He spoke Aramaic, but he worshipped in Hebrew. Why worship in a language you don't speak vernacularly? Well, Jesus did. That's usually good enough for me. Uh, so hopefully that's good enough uh, for you. Um, but the Jews did it. This isn't something shocking or new. Uh, but the Jews did it. A number of the Eastern churches do in some capacity. You'll have to ask Father Matlack uh, for details on that one. Um, but Cardinal Rente said even other religions, like pagan religions, a number of them had a sacred language. So it seems to be something ingrained in us. Sort of like in every you know, civilization, you had the idea of sacrifice. You would sacrifice to God or the gods. And that idea of sacrifice sort of written on the human heart. And uh, I think to a, a, perhaps a smaller degree, the idea of worshiping God in a sacred language um, is something that humanity, I think, is pretty quite used to. Uh, another reason why this is important, the devil hates it, <laughs> which pleases me greatly. Uh, he really does. He, some prayers are simply more efficacious in Latin. You talk to exorcists, they'll say, well, sometimes it just ain't going to work unless you switch over to God's language. Um, you know, the, the most, I'm, I'm not the diastin exorcist. I, I've, been, I've seen a number of um, cases, though, and the most sort of shocking of the cases, most dramatic, most Hollywood-esque, um, and the only one I think the, this young woman was showing signs of full bodily possession. The only thing it said to me, because I was just assisting, um, and I was saying sort of a longer form of the St. Michael prayer in Latin sort of over and over again. Uh, she used an expletive, I won't use it here, but she basically told me to stop at the Latin, or it told me to stop at the Latin. And I just looked up and said, uh-huh, and just kept going. <laughs> I mean, and... Yeah, that just motivated, motivated me further. And of course, I'm like the Latin guy, so I'm really happy. That's like the one thing the devil has ever said to me. Um, but he really does hate it. I suppose a last sort of important point um, that I can think of, why Latin is important in particular to the Roman Rite, is its relationship with the music of the Roman Rite, namely Gregorian chant. Um, we can't go into great detail as to what music is and its power and influence over uh, human nature, but I suppose I could sum it up very quickly in that, you know, there are different types of music, we all know that, and they influence us in different ways. Uh, some music is oriented towards our concupiscible appetites, just to stir the passions, you know, that we you would perhaps hear at, uh, you know, in a, in a nightclub or, you know, something like that. Um, anybody who uh, goes into war or um, even just athletes before a strenuous athletic event, you know, they're not listening to classical music in those headphones. I mean, they're listening to something very angry like Eminem, um, inflaming their irascible appetites because you know, music can have that influence on us, of course. Um, you have other types of music like um, uh, folk music, um, classical music that correspond to the human will. And you see how we're sort of going up to our higher faculties. But the type of music that corresponds to our highest faculty, namely the intellect, is Gregorian chant. It is different. Um, and that's because it's appealing not to our emotions, which we 21st century Americans are simply addicted to. Uh, everything appeals to our emotions. And that's why you have sort of rock band masses uh, seem to appeal to a lot of people. It's appealing to that aspect of them um, that gets appealed to a lot, namely the emotions. I get it. I understand it. But here's the problem. When applied to the Holy Liturgy, we're not here to give God our emotions. We're not here to have an emotional experience. We're not even here necessarily to learn more about God. This isn't a Bible study with hymns. 
Um, there are aspects of learning more about God. There are didact didactic moments of the liturgy. That's why we have readings. That's why we recite the creed. That's why we have a homily. Um, but the heart of the holy sacrifice of the Mass is sacrifice. Is the representation of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our altar. Those educational parts of Mass are good but they're meant to prepare us for something even higher and better. Namely, that we can join uh, Our Lady and the saints in the church triumphant. We can join with Jesus Christ in his sacrifice, represented in an unbloody manner, on our altar, offering ourselves to the Father by the power of the Holy Ghost. And a very helpful aspect of that is music. Um, how do you connect yourself to Christ and his sacrifice? It is a human act. So, namely, these are things that pertain to the intellect and to the will, not to the emotions. If you have a warm, bubbly feeling at Mass, congratulations and enjoy it. But that's not what this is about. Um, it's about offering yourself, which is an act of the will. You think Christ had warm bubblies on the cross? No. Uh, but you're giving yourself acknowledging Jesus Christ and the Holy Trinity as the true God and giving yourself in, a per, in an act of love. The Holy Sacrifice is about the gift of self, an act of love to God in union with the sacrifice of Christ. And so we need uh, a music that pertains not to our lowest faculties, but rather to our highest. Because if you appeal to your highest faculty, you will be able to gather all of your lower faculties much better. You know, we live very busy lives, and with these demonic little things, which I'm addicted to, uh, phones, um, we are pulled around in, you know, different concerns and news and whatever else. And Gregorian chant has the unique power to gather us together, to calm our, our minds, our hearts, our thoughts, our feelings, so that we can gather all of our life together and begin that process of giving ourselves in union with Christ to the Father. Why do I say all this about music? Because Gregorian chant in the Latin language, it was a match made in heaven. They simply go together. And Gregorian chant to English is like, eh, that's nice. I'm sorry, that's it. Like, it. In Latin, it simply just works better. So that's yet another reason for Latin. Um, I could just drone on about all sorts of stuff, but I would say that's about it. So thank you. <laughs> Of course, I should have addressed the question, so where do we go from here? My answer is, boo. we'll see. I mean, I'm doing my part. I, you know, the other priests will do their part, and the Pope should do his part, and the bishops. So um, we should educate people. Uh, we should understand that um, the people are used to what they're used to. And uh, to go in and to change everything overnight, like they did 50 years ago, um, ain't nobody got time for that. So we have to be very, you know, careful and charitable and meet people where they are, but slowly educate them. But I, I think that most foundational point is we're here not to have, it's not Burger King. You know, we need to worship God in the way that he needs to be worshiped. And um, I think that's the most fundamental point. And just kind of slowly reintroducing it. And then we'll see how the Holy Ghost guides us. So any, any questions?
That's what we call a why question. Uh, <laughs> something we tend to avoid answering. I, I mean, short answer, it, it, I don't know. I, well, I have my ideas, but I'm not going to presume on anybody else's intentions. Um, I, I mean, obviously, the 60s were a re revolutionary time. Uh, what was old had to go. Uh, what was new had to come in. I can tell you that the day after John the 23rd promulgated that 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 huge document, Veterum Sapientia, um, Jesuits in Rome began for the first time teaching in Italian, which they had been teaching in Latin up until that point. So that just shows you the some kind of the re, the rebellious uh, spirit of the time. But yeah, but I don't. That's I, that that spirit has died, and virtually every seminarian I know. Uh, loves at least the idea of Latin and would probably check the box if he was given the opportunity. Hey, do you want to be fluent in Latin? I think a lot of them would. We just got to give the possibility. And I'm working on it. So we're getting there. Um, and just uh, one other comment. You're, you may, some of you may ask, well, how can you be helped with Latin? I'm also working on that as well. I want Charlotte to be a Latin hub. Uh, and I'm working on many little things. Uh, so um, for both, not sem just seminarians, but also lay folks, homeschoolers, um, I'm going to try to attract some really good Latin folks into the area. It's awesome. <laughs> but no, I mean, that's a good question. Good point about you have different people doing different things. A priest is up to, at the altar doing his thing, getting incensed or whatever. The, the people, the uh, choir is chanting something and people are getting incensed. And it's glorious. It's like little bees going out for honey, just kind of doing their own thing. And all part of the same hive. It's very organic. I love it. So... <laughs> I don't know how valid that answer is, but it, it pleases me greatly. That's my answer. Um, yeah. So did those who pushed for vernacular in the, in the, the Latin West, uh, did they use the, well, excuse or example that in a number of the Eastern churches had vernacular? I honestly don't know. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they employed uh, those reasons. Um, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I need to make one very important distinction about when we say the Latin Mass, we're meaning the extraordinary form. So that ritual that has been around forever. Okay. The new mass, which most always is in English or vernacular, it can be celebrated in Latin entirely. Um, but almost nobody does. I mean, a few people do it, but it's like, if you can go Latin, go the whole way. Um, what are the suggestions for trying to follow along? I've been going to Latin mass for like a, a year, and then every time I go, I'm like, Sure. Is that uh, a red Ecclesia Day yes, booklet yes. you have? Okay. Yes. And, then... and I still get lost. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, probably the, most, the easiest thing to do would be to um, partner partner up with somebody who feels a little bit more comfortable. Um, you know, uh, that's obviously the easiest thing to be able to be sitting or kneeling next to somebody who can just sort of give a you know give point the way uh, for you. Um, I, this is one of those things, I, again, whenever you hear me introducing a new Latin Mass somewhere, I always, of course I always have the, the three Mass rule, which you guys can probably recite right now. But the first time you're confused, completely confused. Uh, the second time you're intrigued, and the third time you're hooked. And um, I found that that's been the case a lot of times. And it's just, again, one of those sort of organic things you just slowly 
begin to absorb and do. I mean, you hear per omnia secula seculorum. Amen. Okay, we're ready. Um, and you just feel it. You just know. I don't know. Uh, so I would recommend partnering up with somebody who perhaps is, um, you know, better first. And um, I really wish there was like one great YouTube video that was like the golden bullet. Maybe I have to do it. <laughs> Treasure and tradition. Could you stand and just stand it? It's uh, it goes into the details of the mass and also shows you the position of the priest and it has a lot of pictorial aids, both uh, current and then also the tradition and history from the Old Testament as well. Tonight, so it's mass without music, um, and then the high or 
expression of mass is the solemn high mass, where you have a priest, deacon, and subdeacon all vested, and that's a much more fuller expression of the liturgy. Um, and then sort of in between is the sung mass, where sort of, I don't know if it's a low mass on steroids or a watered down solemn mass, but you just have the one priest, but there's music, so degrees of solemnity.
Thanks, y'all.